Hey everybody, we are Robert, Martin, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back to Snakes and Otters, everyone. This is episode 68, Code of Honor. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. All right, guys, this is Robert in the captain's chair, and we know this is probably our favorite kind of episode. Yeah. It's a little bit more freewheeling, which, considering how some of our other episodes go, that's saying something. That's, that's saying right. a lot. That's it? saying it a is. lot. Yeah. Um, but it's more freewheeling in the sense that, uh, really, we get really creative with it. We have and no idea where we're we going to go. <laughs> we don't know where we're going. We don't know what the essence of the... Because generally, there's one or two themes that will... will come up and that we all you know even though you guys give me all the all the credit for tying it together i think we all do a really good job of playing off of one another and to me this is just one of the most fun episodes that yeah. we can do yeah, we so have great, we have a great time we do so we all know i go last so who's going to go first today we didn't really talk about that in the show prep but uh, who wants to go first francis i'd like for you to go first you would time. okay i think i've stolen it the last couple of times and i, well, I we don't, don't want to be, be greedy well I, we I, don't want to be predictable there's some truth to that. That's right. Other than me going last. That's right. And as it went, well, you know, the hammer has to do what the hammer has to do. Yeah, that's Sorry. true. Sorry. That's just kind of the way that works here. Oh, uh, Robert, would you mention our circumstances again? Oh, of course. Of course. These are very special circumstances, even more special than the last five months, because we are now back together again. Hey, really? Our second episode recorded in person. That's for, right. It's been five months since we've done a recording in, per in person. We always do a great job whenever we do, but there's something ma a little bit more magical, a little bit sweeter when we're all together because we I think things are richer. We, we just manage to do that. Being in person, it, it has advantages you just can't replicate. That's right. The Brotherhood of Snakes and Otters. The Brotherhood Amen. of Snakes and Amen, Otters. Brother. Sibling. Siblings. That's oh, right. We are recording in Studio M. In, in uh, the upgraded, in the upgraded uh, refurbished Studio, studio M. Yes, uh, right. you, you, define Studio M, please. Well, I've studio, been wanting you to do this because Studio M is I, I just call I just call all the places we record, of course, in our houses, Studio M for Studio Martin, right? And your place is Studio F for Francis, right. and Studio, studio R for Robert, right? But yours is where's yours located? I mean, it, yes, yours is located in I think you said the Baxter Building. Well, it was the basement of the Baxter Building since I've relocated uh, during uh, all of this. It is now on the second floor uh, of the Four Freedoms Plaza, perhaps. Uh, for, I like that even better. I like that even Four Freedoms Plaza. Okay, well, we'll next time I think we're recording at my place, so uh, you'll we'll use be, that. we'll use that. But I want you to define yours because you yes. use it all the time, but we rarely use it yes, on air. We yes, we're in Studio M. On the thirtieth floor of the Nakatomi Building, there you go. Around behind the waterfall, just down from the hall from Ellis's office. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I wanted to record that for posterity because we've had short snippets of it, but we've never really yes. nailed so, that. Listeners, out. if you don't recognize those references, you must only be twelve or years old or something. That's okay. We love our young or lived in a box. That's right. That's right. Die hard, folks. <laughs> uh, rent it. Love it. It's legend. Uh, my family, we watch it every Christmas. That's Eve. right, because it is a Christmas it movie. It is a Christmas movie. That's correct. Uh, it's an action movie set at Christmas. Oh, Martin's being contrarian again. Well, <laughs> I'm totally with you. That's it. The beauty of it is we're all correct, as, as with yeah. great things on that. No, I usually will, will do, I'll do a, a service uh, at 5 o'clock and I'll do a service at midnight. Between the two, when all the family comes over, I will insist yes, that we in watch. In between celebrating the giver of all life. We'll blow stuff up. We'll and blow stuff up and kill, kill people. people. That's correct. <laughs> All right. Virtually, of course. Vir yes. uh, because it's darn fun. It's it darn is. fun. Right. So, Francis. I am going totally different. New subject. Totally, totally new subject, as Monty Python would say. I haven't told you guys much about this, but I have recently become a devotee of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, I find the man extremely fascinating. I find his work... I mean, you could make the argument of who is the greatest American author, Hemingway would certainly be one of those names that would be, be in the argument. Yeah. You would oh, be yeah. in the argument. He, he is that good. And I have, I'm both, I'm reading both his complete works, believe it or not. Yes, I know I'm still working my way through War and Peace. We've talked about that. Uh, I've said it Anybody aside. who can read War and Peace without reading other stuff in between is a masochist. Well, <laughs> It's pretty good stuff. I'll give you that. I'm not. Yes, but I'm, uh, that's so great. long. You almost got to have a break. Though. Well, and and it's, it, pandemic had a little bit to do with that. It both it both uh, gave me the reason to read War and Peace, and it decided maybe I need to read more than just War and Peace. But I have decided I'm going to read 
all of Hemingway because surprisingly enough, it's not that hard. All the stuff he did, he was not one for long stuff. And the way he writes brief, clipped sentences in many ways, it's easy reading. That's one mm-hmm. of the reasons I think he's so popular. Uh, but I'm also reading his biography. The man was amazing. He brought himself with him in everything he did, and usually we use that as a slam. In this case, that's a strength. He was really that interesting. And he was just so prolific, in not in quantity, but in quality. And I think that's why he's so very very much beloved. And uh, I encourage anybody, if you haven't done, dove into Hemingway, you should. It's not hard. He wrote lots of short stories. They're so easy to read, but they're so profound. Enough of my little Hemingway commercial You're doing there. something else to go by well, you, That's correct. I, I, a couple episodes ago, you guys convinced me to get into more into Michael Shara, so I went out and bought a, uh, I'm sorry, a Jeff Shara. Right, yeah. So we, now I've got to go by Hemingway. But, but, well, <laughs> sorry, you know, we always make each other better, guys. We know that. That's, that's what we intend. My intention at this point is to con- to get a, and Amazon has them, there's a Hemingway collected series that they all match, and you know I'm kind of all about that on the shelf. Uh, that's my next goal. That's my next purchase over time. But since Hemingway's on my mind, and Hemingway is kind of my thing, I said, well, when we were, I was preparing to pick a quote for this, I said, well, let's go see what Hemingway had to say. And yes, of course, I found one. And uh, this quotation, it's pretty certain it's him. It was published in a magazine, actually. It's not from one of his novels or short stories. Uh, but it was, it's been attributed to him. It's pretty much well known to be him. Uh, it's very brief, uh, and like so many good quotations, it is itself. It's not stolen from anything else. It's not meant to be have a greater context. It just is what it says it is. Uh, and I'll give it to you right now. There is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. True nobility is being superior to your former self self. And I read that thing. I said, boys, that's us. Always trying to make ourselves better, more educated, more understanding, more engaged, more emotionally affected and more emotionally affecting in what we do. That's what Snakes and Otters is about. Trying to make that old version of ourselves less than the new. The new is always getting better. Not only just us making ourselves better, but by extension that the quote doesn't support this. I'm just extrapolating here. That by making ourselves better, we also make the world around us better. We that's make what strength it, and honor is all that's about. That's correct. We make our by making ourselves better, better, not more superior. That comes with it, but that's not the goal. Being superior to your former self, you're always enriching yourself, as Jean Luc Picard would say. Well, that's a it, that's a wonderful quote in in the context of of our faith because. Uh, you know, we recognize, and we've talked about this many times on the show, that part of our faith is uh, becoming better people, becoming more uh, authentically human, and by that we mean more Christ-like, bringing about the kingdom of God. Is what yes, it's one of the ways of saying it. Uh, yes, you know, one of the reasons that uh, uh, I love being Catholic, besides the fact that I believe that it is absolutely one hundred percent true, is confession. Confession is very much the recognition that I'm a flawed man, and I recognize that, and it's in the the uh, uh, in the right that you say you uh, have a firm purpose of amendment mm-hmm. that you are going to try and make yourself better. Right, and, and that is, it's an oath in many respects. Yes, and so that, I think that's a, that's a great quote because it, it's really also at the at the heart of all good. Personal development. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you guys know I'm really big into that, oh, yeah. that sort of material, and you know there, there's a it is a truism in many ways that if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think when it comes to working on ourselves, that is true because nothing is static. The only thing that is static is what is dead. We've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if you're not moving forward, trying to be better than the person you were, then you, you are becoming worse than the person you are. Well, it comes out in the physics of the universe, too, because there's no such thing as things being stationary. You're either expanding or you're contracting, but it's one or the other. Right. And I, I, I'm one to resist the either-or question. Of course, you know that. I think everything is both and. But this is one of those times where you're exactly right. 
you're either bettering yourself or you're not, and by not, you are worsening yourself. Yes. Now, you know, you could make the argument that it is both and in the sense that you can be bettering yourself in one area and worsening sure. yourself. It's in complex. Another. It's complicated. It's, it's complicated. That's right. Travis Slattery, we all know, he's one of our favorite guys. It's complicated. It's complicated. Hey, it's uh, complicated. But, yeah, you know, to me, this is. This is at the essence of being fully alive. Hemingway would jump all over that and say, you're exactly right. Because he was, as I, like I said, I'm reading his biography too. He was a proponent, as Teddy Roosevelt was, of, he wouldn't call it the strenuous life, as Roosevelt would, but it's the fullness of life. The absolute going forth. and as, Being in the arena. In the arena, as Thoreau would say, breaking open the marrow of life and sucking it out. Uh, he believed in living life to its fullest because you only get one life, as he would say. Irony of irony, of course, he committed suicide. That's another thing. But only because of the... He, he couldn't... He, he could not conceive of life as an invalid, as, as ill, which is what he was facing. We know that now. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is an unfortunate consequence of this understanding of life, but it still doesn't invalidate the fact that what he was saying is you have to embrace the life you've been given. You know, was it a Tolkien would say it? All you have to decide is what to do with the time that's been given to you. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. It is much like Robin Williams. Uh, we just did that episode on Robin Williams yeah. there a couple of weeks ago, and it's very much the same vein. He lived everything right up to the hilt, uh-huh. and had a lot of difficulty coming to the realization that he was ill. That is, you know, and, that, and that is exactly much. it. Yeah, we, that if, same thing. There were, you know, he was both of those uh, great, great giants of talent, Hemingway and Robin Williams. We, they were so unable, you know, they were still human even through their genius. Yeah. Couldn't and that's, imagine, could not imagine still could being not, an active life. With this illness, that's right. Which um, is a fallacy, we know. Yes, and it but, is. And I'll say, you know, I, I'm not Catholic. However, I, I'm I share in that the Catholic ideal of that suicide is is not an acceptable way out. Correct. Uh, it, it, and, we, and we not, understood. it doesn't condemn. I don't. No, no. I don't. I'm making plain. I'm not, not condemning those who, who take their own life. Or I'm not going to say, oh well, they're Headed straight to hell or anything. We like don't that, believe that and have it for many, 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 many. We never really did, but there were many proponents of it. We just couldn't understand it. And now that science has got to the point, we recognize that anyone who takes their own life by definition was mentally ill to the point of despair yeah. and and not and not being responsible. Yeah. We believe in the mercy. Perhaps not mentally overhead. ill is just not. Not fully cognizant of, or not fully right. uh, in their faculties. At, how do you want to put that, it? Yes. At that time, at the yeah, time that's they correct. did. Yeah, yes. don't, I don't yeah, want to. There's I don't a, want to create a narrative. That yeah, there's, there's a selfishness to it that is hard for me to to cope with. That is a very common understanding. That yeah. people see it that way, but that selfishness itself is not mentally stable. Well, and those who commit suicide aren't always thinking of it as it's about me. It's about making life better for those I leave behind. Because they often think that they it's, would be better the, off. Yeah, 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 as Trevor yes. would say, it is, it is complicated. I do know one thing, though, as, as what I do professionally does delve a little bit into this area. And one of the things I have discovered uh, that I've been educated on is we don't actually say anymore committed suicide because that implies intent. Died by suicide is the proper term these days. Really? Yes, it's. it's I had it's, not heard that. It is. It is because commit suicide is such a lex- word in our lexicon. Everybody uses it, but for those, and I've, and I've learned this from speaking with folks, survivors of whose families have pr- passed away. In that issue, because of that, we do not want to label in death the blame for that on the person themselves. That's not our place to do that. We as Catholics believe that's. God judges these sort of things. We don't. Right. So this kind of takes us out of that mix by saying died by suicide. It, it is clear. Judgment. It is clear, but it is not pejorative. And it's just, you know, just just something for uh, for all of us to. I don't know how in the world we got on this. Subject. <laughs> well, it was Hemingway. Well, and the next thing well, you know, there's there. so much to unpack. Again, that's what I was going to say. Uh, on the one hand, unpacking again, you're talking about this living the life, being in the arena, or being this uh, physical and active life. Um, you know, and, 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 and 
having that difficulty of Some folks understanding that, handle. that position that Hemingway and Robin Williams found themselves in of, of this whole existence as this active person because Robin Williams, I, again, we talked about this during his uh, episode, you know, he's, his comedy was as much physical as verbal. Oh, yeah, uh, not in Not in a slapstick way, but he's a dynamo. He's a movement that was inherent uh, to him. Yeah, yes. he's a yeah, he's a ball of energy. Yeah, this whirling dervish, and and you know, even even when he wasn't on cocaine, he was a, <laughs> a very energetic, active guy. So there's a lot to unpack there, and and just wow, it's, you really really got some deep stuff going here, Francis. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I've always I've always inherently believed in mercy. Mercy, and uh, that's one of these one of the subjects I know that we're going to get to in, in one of these Code of Honor episodes because uh, to me it is a huge, huge piece mm-hmm. of being human. Forgiveness sounds wonderful. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, people think it's simple uh, that you can simply say "I forgive you." A lot of people believe that. That's true. You can say it. Forgiveness. Not is everyone fun. means it. That's correct. Or you may mean. I, and I, I was once told some. Uh, I tried to explain once to a person. Uh, who believed that, well, you, you, I said, forgiveness is something that you find yourself, when you've been wronged or harmed, especially in a significant way, you may be able to forgive the person who harmed you or wronged you uh, with full honesty on, on a given day. But other days, when yes. whatever it is that triggers you, brings you back, you hate that person with just as much virulence as it did when they hurt you. And, the, and I was chastised by that saying, well, you never forgave them in the first place. I totally repudiate that understanding of forgiveness. That is not what it means. Wouldn't it be great if we human beings had the ability to be so monolithic that we could forgive and be done? It doesn't work that way. That is applying uh, one understanding of God's forgiveness mm-hmm. to humans that is impossible. Because right. we believe that when God, works that God forgives us, it's not that he forgets it because he's God. He can't forget anything. Right. But that it is so that the act that was a sin that he has now forgiven is now so inconsequential to so so that it doesn't even matter. It's it's as inconsequential to uh, to him as a grain of sand in a beach. That's right. Unless it's gotten into our yeah. swim trunks. <laughs> to us, that's how that's. Mm-hmm. But we're human. We can't always be like that. Yeah, yes, can, I think we, we can honestly say, I forgive you, but then the next day... That's right. And we mean it. And we, we mean, mean it. We mean it. And th- th- that's a great thing. That's that's one of those things that makes us about human. But the beauty of this is where I'm kind of wor- worrying back to is forgiveness is one thing. Mercy is something completely different. Mercy is something you can always do because it's how you deal with it. It's, it's practical. It's how it's. I mean, it's it's also in, in, internal. It's also emotional. But it's it's the outgrowth of, of the forgiveness that you can you give, give an example of that. Be it's how you treat the other person. Encountering the person who once harmed you. You are kind to them. That's being merciful. Or even better, not taking glee at revenge when you see somebody fall. Because I can tell you, in my lifetime, many people I've had some crap jobs. You guys know this. Yes. Elm, every single one of those. People that treated me badly in those positions themselves fell a great fall eventually. If I were an unmerciful person, I would take great glee in that. But I've learned, and say I haven't occasionally. But as well, a general it's rule, like the forgiveness, that's it's, correct. It's impossible to be perfect. But I at. try to get back on a say, try to think those are people too, no matter how evil they may be or not. And someone probably depends on them. Maybe or maybe not. I'm, I'm well, yes, that is very true. Because that's correct. I'll tell you, uh, have an example, uh, a man that we all know, uh, and I don't want to get into details in case somebody who would <laughs> know the situation would hear, but he feels like he was wronged greatly by someone in a position of authority over him. Mm-hmm. And I think he has a very good case. Yeah. And they refuse to acknowledge mm-hmm. that there was a wrong, much less to ask for forgiveness and to say that I'm sorry. So he feels like he can't offer forgiveness for something that hasn't been recognized as right. a wrong. You can't forgive the unrepentant. Right. And I think that's a fallacy. I, well, for humanity, I think yeah. it's a fallacy. Yeah, yeah. We should still try. For God, well, that's kind of the point when you talk about that kind of absolute forgiveness. Because that's absolute. Yeah. That if I'm unrepentant, I can't accept the forgiveness God offers. Yep. That's right. It's not that he doesn't offer it. It's I can't accept it. Because forgiveness is a two-way street. Mm-hmm. 
Because mercy, if I don't forget, and, and well, mercy, mercy is, is not though. Actually, is what I was going well, to say is because God can be merciful to the unrepentant. Yes, and well, his very offer of forgiveness is, is an act is, of is, mercy. Is, is an act of mercy. It's complicated. Well, and then there's a whole other piece to this quote too. Again, it would, like I said, a lot to unpack that I really like. In we've talked about the the strenuous life, the in the arena, being in an active life. And listeners, you may not get this from uh, you know all the talk about bourbon and how manly we are, but we're not terribly athletic, fellas. No, <laughs> no, not at all. No, <laughs> no. You know that was something that I was thinking about when we were talking about that piece. Uh, you know, when we we're talking about Robin Williams and Hemingway not being able to handle the thought of a life uh, that was uh, disabled in some way. Mm-hmm. For myself, physically limited. Right. The physically limited part is not scary to me. No, no. Losing my my ability to think. Yes. My ability the, to see. That's mm-hmm. the terrifying future. Those are two things that are terrifying to me. Yes. Yeah, because that's kind of the, yes. the door we walk in through. Yes. Is, is the intellectual, mental, and emotional and, and fullness of that. We, I don't want to suggest, just because we are not athletic or physical. Uh, right. That's yeah. where I wanted to get, is that it doesn't mean that this isn't an active life. Right, an engaging exactly. life. That's correct. Snakes and honors is a part of our life where we are seeking and stretching, stretching those muscles, but a different type. It's of It's a muscle. different arena that That's we right. are engaging in. Engaging yes. in the arena of ideas and philosophy and goodness and good versus evil and bettering ourselves. To go back to the Hemingway quotation, we're looking to do that here, right? And, and not would, just ourselves, but everybody who listens to us. I would argue that that arena that is more philosophical than physical the arena of the mind is where that betterment has to take place it has to because just because i lose weight which i have been losing during uh, coronavirus which is you know instead of putting on corona weight i've taken off corona well, weight. Good, for you. Sir. good for you brother um, you are unique <laughs> yeah well maybe not unique but it, i have been You're certainly the minority it, well you know i find well, that i snack less at home than i do at work yeah. Especially yeah. keep it out of the house. Interesting. Well, I, I tell you what, during the pandemic, we made a rule. Uh, I'm, I'm cutting myself down on the soft drinks. Mm-hmm. So the sugar drinks, of course, I can't stand diet ones anyway. So I They're hard cut, to get used to. I couldn't drink diet ones anyway. So I just cut the whole deals out. So Good for you. No sweet tea. And I'm down to about one soft drink a week instead of maybe oh, wow. one a day. I, I tell you what, it, that alone will cause you to drop weight. I did it yes. for a while and I couldn't stay with it. I didn't, I didn't, well, and that's not true. I didn't want to stay with it. That's right. the problem. The other, so, yeah. yeah, you know, being, I, I, that being that, looking for that philosophical betterment, I think is, is far more important because just losing weight doesn't make me a better version of me than I was. Now, a healthier version. It's healthier. And maybe that causes me to have less stress in other areas and causes there may be a ripple effect, but that's not the focus. Yeah. Uh, you but know. it improves your health and you will be with us longer, we hope. Most, yeah. uh, hopefully, yes, because, you know, one of the things that, that made this an impetus, you know, kind of going a rabbit hole here, getting older, we're all in our 50s now. Uh, next year, well, very soon, you will qualify will, for some senior discounts. Oh, for God's sakes. Yes, that's correct. Sept- it's 55. Some of them kick in. That's right. 55, September 30th, the Feast of St. Jerome, patron saint of crabby people. I can understand. <laughs> yeah, he's the patron saint of, get off of my lawn, you kids. That's correct. Yes, that's right. Uh, but My favorite saint. That's right. That's, uh, you, yeah, you would uh, love it. That's correct. Yes. You know, we are, uh, we are closer to death than we are to birth, unfortunately. <sighs> Yes. And one of the things that you realize when you start paying attention to people who live long lives, almost none of them are fat. You know? Well, you, you have it surrounded, sir. You're exactly right. Yeah. So, and to me, that's a big, you know, about being here as long as I can because not that I'm afraid to die, but I feel like I just have too much to do before I die. Well, yes. that's, that's, that's yes. true. I love that feeling. I love that feeling of having something to accomplish because then you do not feel old. Right. I do not feel fifty-four years old. No, I, I, no, I no, do no. not. Because my I wife do. would say I have the mind of a you know fifteen-year-old, but that's an entirely oh, different I thing. Absolutely, yeah. do. all the day. I absolutely suppose. do. Uh, there's, I just feel like there's things I want to do and accomplish. Part of it is seeing this be a, a, a deal, you know, yeah. being out there, uh, 
well, you know, thanks and honors. We, we're approaching two thousand downloads on this podcast. We've never mentioned that on air, but that's true. I mean, we've got lots. Of thank you to our regular listeners. Yes, and spread the word for us uh, because we we are one of the few podcasts that have achieved escape velocity launch uh, because we've been doing this now for sixty sixty eight episodes uh, uninterrupted for almost two years. Most podcasts don't last past twenty. Well, they think they're seasonal. The, yeah, they're, exactly. At you best. do ten episodes and call that a season and quit. And I think the other thing that makes us so special and that I'm so proud of is we're not a single issue podcast. That's correct. That, I mean, maybe that's hurting us that we're not a niche. You know, the true crime ones have taken off. Well, mm-hmm. people love those. Maybe harder and to it, find us, but it's not harder to enjoy us. There you go. There you because go. Because we are we. One of the things that I truly believe in this day and age of podcast con- consumption, not to go off on these rabbit holes, but you know that's what we do. That's what we do. That's uh, to to say that you've got to be eternally fresh and eternally interesting, and we strive really hard for that. And if that means that we are jack of all trades, I love it. I, love I it. would I love say it. we are not jack of all trades so much as just we are one of the most eclectic. That's Podcast a better word. That's, yeah. right. that's right. There's l- you know, we discuss a lot of good things, but we, in many respects, that quote from Hemingway, to swing us back around here before I hand it over to Martin here, is that kind of says what we are. It is. We, we, uh, we, want, we want everybody to be better. We, while we talk about a lot of different things, generally in four categories, as we have five when you count hoopa jubes, we still talk about the same thing every time. What it means to be authentically... A growing human being, mm-hmm. uh, to what it means to be a good person. That's right. Better and better um, all the time. And I don't mean just better and better, but I mean you know somebody who is capital G good as opposed to capital E evil. Yeah. Uh, and how that affects yeah. the relationships. Yeah. Everything comes down a, to that a, when we a talk. Growing, about it. emotionally mature, decent human being. Right. And who would have thought that the three of us would ever sit down to talk about that? Well, I'm. I'm just. I'm thankful that you guys are pulling me along because I. You know, well, I need we pull each other along. Assistance being a decent human being. Well, you know, the bourbon helps sometimes. Yes. Bourbon shared makes everything yes. work. Together. I was going to do that when you I turned just, it over to me. I, I thought I was, you, I was mentally sensitive. I was going to do it before I summed everything my, up, but we can te- certainly my do it. My telepathy now. was yes. sensing the So, need. listeners, I am uh, sipping on a little bit more of this bullet bourbon that we had last episode, and I'm pleasantly surprised. I really do like it quite a bit. And Robert, you are also having a. Uh, oh no, Robert, no, no! We turned have, you over to the old tub. I finally have my first taste of the old tub because I've not been able to get out to get my own bottle. Yeah. So I've been looking forward to this, and so it was described to me as hundred proof basil Hayden. Uh, I don't think it's as smooth as a basil Hayden, mm-hmm. but I can certainly understand the hundred proof part. Uh, so it's a little bit it has more bite than the bullet. Uh, which oh, is, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> nice one, Centauri. I liked it, liked it. Then yes. uh, that, that we talked about last time, but it, it's interesting because you know every bourbon has its different uh, focus point in your body. So for this one, it comes through the the nasal passage. It does, yeah. which I don't think I've encountered a bourbon that does that yet. So th- that was a that was a surprise, but it's got a nice flavor. It's got a good bite. Uh, not in a bad way, uh, and it, it does hang around a little bit. That, that uh, oaky, woodsy flavor yeah. to it that I really, really like. Um, and it's a twenty dollars bourbon. That's amazing. It's twenty yeah. bucks. Go That's get right. a bottle of Old Tub uh, for as long as Beam's going to make it for twenty bucks. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great. It's you great. You cannot bourbon. beat it for twenty. That's bucks. right. Yeah. It's great. It's wonderful. It, shared, of course. Bourbon is always best. Yeah, when it's it, it is not a, a, a cheap, horrible flavor type. This they, is not a very old Barton. It doesn't taste like medicine at all. It, yeah. It's really oh, awesome. even a very old Barton is not necessarily that bad. No, it's yeah. it's, 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 it's lower end, but it's, it's it's still quality stuff. Yeah, it's still yeah. There's dependable. only one bourbon I don't care for so far, and it's Buffalo Trace. Oh, really? Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. And, 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 and oh, there goes that sponsorship. Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to have Buffalo Trace as a sponsor, <laughs> but Buffalo Trace tastes like medicine to me. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, we I, I'd have to have some here to We've to never had it on the show. I know that. Yes. I don't recall we we must have mentioned it in other conversations because I don't think we've ever mentioned it on on online. Uh that's very interesting. Uh hmm. I did, you know, again as you would say very famously, you know, even bad bourbon is still bourbon. That's it's right. still pretty good, but uh we've we've done the we've learned enough in our time on this podcast and otherwise to discern a little bit about what's good. 
And I can see where if something reminds you of medicine, that would be right out. Would, as, that, as, yeah, as, that's right. As, out. At the same price point, do Old Tub. Yeah, if you've only got twenty bucks to spend on on alcohol, a get a bottle of Old Tub. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah, very much so. And, and Francis, you uh, were still on the bullet. I went well. I, I could have I could have refreshed with the Old Tub, but I like I have been able to get out. I've got a bottle at home. That's what I've been drinking when we've been virtual. I'm hoping to get a bottle on the way home from here. You should. Yeah, that way we uh, oh do that. Yeah, yeah. But I had never had the bullet. Until we gathered together here this yeah. time, so I refreshed my, my glass with this here in these in these wonderful little uh, these uh, bullet labeled uh, drinking glasses that you've got here. I'm liking it. I really is. I knew of it. Uh, I under, you know the, the uh, it's very it's a small company if I recall correctly uh, that this is what they do and uh, the master distiller slash owner of it. Uh, he's very proud of his product. I've seen him him use his personality to promote it. And that resonates with me, as I think it does with most people. It really, he puts his money where his mouth is. It's quality stuff. It's quality it stuff. Is. That's I like correct. It. I enjoy it. I'm drinking my neat. Now, you got you got yours with yeah. a little ice. And he, he's got a little bit of a, a mythos almost going with his, too. It's, he does. It's kind That's of cool. a, he promotes it as a sort of frontier style. Frontier whiskey. That's correct. It's meant to be. Uh, this is the, the the marketing. And, you know, you guys know me. I love marketing, all about marketing. Uh this is the sort of thing you would find in an old west saloon when you walked in and says, "Give right. me a, give me a glass of, give me a shot of bullet." That's kind yeah, of how this is, yeah, is supposed yeah, to. Assuming you didn't get physically shot, of course, that's yes, right. Yes. It's kind of how this is intended. Evocative to be done. Of, a, of the old yeah, west, the swinging the right doors. So, yeah, exactly. And and Danny Glover stepping up to the bar. Uh, what is it? A bottle of whiskey in a bed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's it's good stuff. I can't say that's a Silverado right. quote. Silverado, that's right. that's right. One of the great westerns. You know, I don't. Did we uh, did we do a little salute to Brian Dennehy when he passed? We did, uh, I think we did we not. Did. We did not. We should. When uh, he passed, as Cobb. He played Cobb, Cobb in Silverado. Yes. Well, yeah, he, he was a great villain. Oh, wasn't he? Well, yes. well, he was great in First Blood with Sylvester oh, Stallone. Yes, he was yes. a great villain there. Uh, he actually he had a great range to him. Uh, he was he could he could do the, uh, the the heroes as well. I mean, he did several of those. He was just one of those great character He's actors. He's a Broadway guy too. I did not realize that. Yeah, no, Danny, uh, he was a Broadway, a big time Broadway guy. Right. Really good at a stuff. Lot, a lot of folks that uh, that do some great stuff. Uh, yeah, we uh, since we're since we're raising glasses, we may well raise. If we already raised one, we'll raise it again because he deserves it. Brian Denny, right. Brian, Brian Denny, rest in peace, my friend. You gave us great enjoyment with your performances. So, so Martin, <laughs> yes, excellent. Yeah, because yeah. we, three been, hours later, <laughs> yeah, we've been rambling quite a bit. So anyway, I'm on a whole different tear. This one is just kind of, it's come up lately at work, and it's just, it's on my mind a ton. So I wanted to do it this time. And the quote is, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> that is uh, attributed to Sir Alec Isagonis. hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. He is a British car designer and the original designer of the Mini. The, the original Mini back in 1959 um, was a very influential car. Um, I know. I have one. Yeah. I, I drive a Mini. Yes, we're Mini Countryman. I love it. Hey, not a, yeah, not a Cooper, but a Countryman. That's right. It's slightly larger. I, yeah. You can fit five people in it buckled. I've gotten my three adult children in the back seat for a short period of time. Short and they period did, of time. And they, did, they didn't complain. Yeah. So, yes, it's 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 a magnificent. I love driving down the road. Uh, quick story. I, when I first bought the Mini, I was over here uh, near Jefferson Mall, and I stopped at a red light uh, in the right-hand lane, and somebody pulled up beside me, honked the horn, I looked over, they rolled down their window and asked me if they could have some Grey Poupon. Yeah. They thought I, my car was British. So, for whatever reason, they just, that's nice. just what they did. So yes. Was, yeah, and the, the current Mini is, is a, it's a still British car company but owned by germans and related to bmws and all but the original mini was very much a landmark kind of kind of car much like a model t or the original volkswagen type one slash beetle um just a revolution in transport for the regular person um you know that that first car that you needed to get around and get that job mm -hmm. and sir alec Isagonis was was the designer um, and, and understood how to use that space for maximum effect. And I just love this quote about 
uh, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Sometimes you just got to do stuff. You, it, just do. It's yours. Don't worry about the committees and the input. And just get it done. Committees oftentimes are an excuse to dilute or even destroy a vision. Yes. I have found. Uh, and a uh, committee with a clear vision that is set at the top and, and shepherded through, it's unbeatable. But this quotation here presumes this is committee and committee alone. Well, Comm- yeah. committee doesn't break... Committee Dilution doesn't- of a vision. It, yeah. it, when you have the vision, you don't need the committee. Yeah, well, well you, you, you could, you can use one because it's... Uh, it's not, the, it's no longer a committee, though. That's, well, I think that's kind of where well, I'm trying I mean, to say I here. I like input, but I don't like, you know, okay, pass it to Shirley and then pass it to Glenn and then pass it to this person. Yeah. And let every- not everybody's input is equal. Well, not that's every, exactly right. everybody's input needs to be used. That's, and that's right. I think that's where that quote is going. Yes. Like, too many cooks spoil the broth. Yes, the same same idea. I've always heard it too as a horse designed by a committee is a cow. It was a little bit funnier version of the same thing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in my job, I do a tiny bit of web design. Not anything super complicated, mostly just based off SharePoint, which, you know, editing in SharePoint's hardly any different than editing in Microsoft Word. Right. It's not real super development or anything. It's not, I'm not really coding. But you're designing in... So you're like, you know what? I know what I like. I know I don't like clicking a lot. I'd rather just look and see everything. We're going to design by that. See, yeah, I'm not right. going to turn this over to a committee. That I, is leadership. I'm because gonna... every, there, there's a presumption here that everyone's opinion is worth hearing. And I know that is a radical thing to f- re- push against. I don't think it's that everybody. Not I think everybody's opinion is. Every person is worthy of having their opinion being heard. Now that opinion may be crap when they give it, mm-hmm. but not every person's opinion has value for what you're working on. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, and not not every person sees your vision right away. Yeah. Well, that's and you, that's very but true because you know, if you've got somebody that gets your vision and and thinks the same way. Put a committee of those people together and you watch your dust because you will get stuff done because you're all thinking together. And I think that's where people in higher ends, higher levels of leadership, whether it be corporate or whatever, if they can, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for people that work, that get the vision, understand what they're trying to do, and can contribute meaningfully from their expertise accordingly. But so many times in so many organizations, especially at the lower levels, you just don't get it. Yeah. And well, it's, it's not a sacred cow. You know, it's it's a it's a horse that got designed wrong. Yes. You know, leadership changes at the top, and that's a good thing. But often, what's the people being led don't change. Yeah. <laughs> and so, somebody's looking at something from the eyes of 1991, isn't seeing the vision of 2021. Mm-hmm. And and you've got to you know that's that's the kind of committee that drags me down and pulls my oh, energy well, yeah. away is when well you know get these people in well I don't but that person is still trapped in this same way they were doing things a long time ago we don't do them that way and yes you you want to pull those people along and get them doing something new but. They have to be willing to There's make a Darwinism that here. I'm sorry. Yeah. But it, it, the, they have the, to un- be the unadaptable will not survive. Well, no. Now, see, in the world of business, that's not true. They do that, survive. They do survive. Oh, you mean the Peter Principle? Well, there's that being but, promoted but, to the level of the But there's also but, a, a resistance to either bringing them along or jettisoning them. Yeah. So, well, which is my point. Well, that's exactly that's right. It shouldn't be that way. Well, maybe it shouldn't. Be. Well, but they're you know, people. Yeah, they're well, talking about correct. their livelihood. And, yeah, and I if they that. do accomplish some part of the work well, okay, that's fine. But just keep them on by committee. Well, that's right. that's kind of where I'm going with this. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't have purpose or place, but making the decisions may not be that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, in an example of what you're talking about. Uh, some of the 1991 thinking versus 2021 thinking. So, you know, we all have had some experience in some kind of IT uh, mm-hmm. situation. One of the things that still drives me nuts and just astounds me 
is encountering people that have absolutely no technology skills. It's and, hard. You know, when you think about it, we, you know, we all work in office you have to situations. Have active malice towards technology to not have some skill nowadays. Well, and yeah, and it's not that they don't have any, but they're almost no better than trained monkeys. That, you know, you give them steps A, B, C, and D. That's all they can do. And that is all they can do. There's and no, there's no. Because there are still people that tell me, well, you know, I was afraid to do anything. I was afraid I might break something. It's like, my God, you can't break something. I mean, the worst you could do is delete a file. You'd have to know explicitly how to format a drive for a that to happen. I make a specific point when I train people, especially on website, how to use our website. I tell them, click, you can't break anything. If you're not supposed to be in that system, you won't have credentials, so don't worry about it. Right. Just because you got to the login page, you're not hurting anything. Right. And if you get an error, that just tells me someplace I need to fix something. You didn't break it. You just exposed it, yeah. which is which gives so me an opportunity I, I to make it better. I deliberately tell them, look, you yeah. can't hurt anything. Click, find out what all these things are. And if somebody takes me up on that, then I know I've got somebody I can count on. Yeah. If they don't, if I, if I find out later that they're too afraid to click on stuff and, and won't explore... The website, it's not that I don't value that person and the work they're doing, but I know I can't come back to them for right. that's, feedback. That's not their thing. There's only certain things you can trust them with. Yeah. And I, I maybe can't. trust is a bad way to put it, but I just they have I, limits that are predefined. Yeah. I'm just not going to get what I need to keep making things better. Right. I know that if, if somebody clicked around in this, that's somebody that I can pull out pieces and start pushing and say... How can I make this better then? I like your interesting your comment about in, uh, deliberate malice. Uh, There's a word for it called mumpsimus. And I yes. used to have this up on my office yes, wall. Yes, I love it. A mumpsimus is someone who actively does not want to find out that there are better ways to do things. Yeah. And I'm, honestly, that is a significant, if not the entirety, but a significant portion of the workforce in probably any uh, country or culture or age, whether it be the guy who is you know working in a mine digging the ore, to the guy who's the CEO that ends up making the widgets you know for the company that makes up the widgets that are made up of that ore and any everybody in between, and those people that can't conceive it, it's like the guy who wanted to close the patent office in the 19th century because he thought everything had been invented anything <laughs> worthwhile. Think about that. Oh yeah, the hubris. Love that word. Hubris. Yes, Hubris. that's right. That's right. It, that, of all that. The small mindedness, the, the well, yeah, lack of it. vision. Mm -hmm. uh, Weak minded. That's what Augustus McCray would call him. You know, it's exactly what the opposite of what we have striven to be. What as we talk about often today is a day for talking about what this show is about, reminding people it's about being better. You know, it, it's the idea that that this is all there is. Yeah. Strength How of, freaking honor is not a compliment. Well, that's right. Yeah, strength you know. honor is not a compliment. It's an exhortation. Right. 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 It's a challenge. A challenge. It's a challenge. And so, Robert, so, you, you got to start bringing this home, buddy. All right. So, Well, we didn't spend nearly as much time on you as we did with, that's with okay. Franny. It happens. That's okay. I mean, mine, it, mine was not a, a, it, it that works, kind of a It works that way in this reverse. Much, we all, we all uh, but you see, uh, But they work together so well. Oh, I here think. comes the hammer. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Hammer time. So I had a couple Don't different hammer. options. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and I'm going to go with Mark Twain. Oh, I love Twain. The great love American Twain. writer, Mark Twain. He would be up there in uh, consideration along with Hemingway. Yes, absolutely. Right. There's yeah. no question. Yeah. That's right. He's in the conversation. Um, so this is a little tongue in cheek. Oh, Twain was famous for that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's also very deep. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's very funny. Uh, it's that same uh, I, you know, I can't remember who said this it probably is like Nietzsche or somebody or Orwell but uh, or no I think it was uh, I think it was Theodore Roosevelt if if everybody's thinking alike then nobody's thinking right right and I and, right. well yeah and I've just mentioned three different people probably none of them actually said that but <laughs> <laughs> that's okay but, but that's how many of these things are plugged into my head but I can't but get the out. saying itself is absolutely uh, valid because yeah. it's exactly what you're saying Twain was trying to say is yeah. you know, if, be very questioning 
if 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 you're swimming, uh, Thomas More would say, if you're swimming along with the tide, there's many people that would turn around just once they realize it, swim in the opposite direction. So yeah, when when you think about what happens when when the majority, uh, you know, obviously there's almost always a majority uh, on a particular issue. Not always, because sometimes there is a plurality of multiple sure. uh, opinions and, and ideas, and that's fine. But when you get enough people that have gathered together on one side of an issue or position or whatever you want to call it, a, a form of groupthink sets in. It oh, becomes an echo the, chamber. The dreaded groupthink. Ooh, yeah, it's one of the great enemy, enemies is, of getting anything done. It is one of the great enemas of getting things done. Uh, oh, I like that too. That's right. It's a, well, sometimes uh, an enema can be a good thing. It, it does tend be. to clean things out and give you a fresh well, start. Well, that's where the pause that's, and reflect part comes That's in. correct, because that ain't um, what we're talking about here. No, but you know, when you think about when everybody agrees, or when you got enough people agree that no longer is any dissent or discussion allowed, uh, it essentially, uh, in many ways... Uh, it creates a tyranny. Mm-hmm. It creates a, t- a tyranny of thought and potentially of action. Because Cancel of, culture. Exactly. <laughs> Very exactly well where put, I was sir. going with That's that. Exactly yes, right. I, I'm reading Robert's mind. By mm-hmm. the way, it was George Patton. George Patton, excellent. It is, is, if everybody's thinking alike, then nobody's thinking is attributed to George Patton. The man was genius. <sighs> Indeed. I, I got too much stuff in my head. Uh, no <laughs> such thing, brothers. No <laughs> such thing. It just means you got a big head. I mean, large mind. Yeah. So, you know this this tyranny of of groupthink is so antithetical to an intellectual state of mind, Mm -hmm. because if you find yourself on the majority on the side of the majority, whether you know no matter what it is, that danger is so real because it stops growth. Growth is struggling against something Mm -hmm. in many ways. That's right. It's overcoming something. Once you're on the side of the majority, there's no longer anything to overcome. You know, there's no new challenge because the challenge, you know, by definition, anything that you, uh, the, any challenge you're trying to overcome, you're in the minority, you're the underdog because you have not mastered it yet. Okay, so when you think about things that way. So even if everybody is on the same side, trying to over, but they're all trying to overcome that challenge because it's different from having a common goal, you know, this being on the side of the majority. It's not an ideological thing, anyway. Generally speaking, this well, but it can be. It can be, but it's yeah. not by definition that. Uh, what the challenge or the uh, the, the process of, well, of yeah. groupthink? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I think groupthink can be ideological. Well, see, that's kind of where I'm I'm kind of pausing posing the question because, in many respects, politics is exclusively groupthink. It is now. Yeah, it is now. It which is we've now, had that yeah. discussion many times. Yeah. Is there it, you are either with us or against us. Right. There's no there's, there's no, no yeah, because the other side compromise is compromise with the devil. That is correct. Right. You are if you are outside of us, you are in your uh out with the uh, And you're, ironically, you're, you're not just an adversary or an opponent, you're an enemy. Well, yes. And it's different. Well, you're evil and evil. Well, you're yes. an evil yes. enemy, and, yes. which must by conscience be destroyed. Yes. So this whole idea of uh, being outside of the majority, the majority designed the cow and the camel, right? Yep. And the majority want to revel in who they are, where they've been, yeah. as opposed to looking forward. So yeah. instead of looking forward to building a better horse, a horseless carriage perhaps, mm-hmm. they're more focused on let's keep making some more buggy whips. Well, yeah, that's true because... Uh, yeah, uh, mediocrity uh, and sameness is the enemy of... Yes, by definition, that is mediocrity. Finding yourself in the majority is mediocrity because you're no longer on the extremes. And not that being extreme is good in a, in a radical sense, but you're no longer um, uh, bound by the the structures of... of, of Convention? Con- convention. Um, but it ties to something else we've talked about and, and that we, we've railed against as well is the mob mentality. Yeah. Because Very it, similar, yes. When, when you're in the majority thinking, then it's easy to keep doing that yes. and to float along and stop thinking altogether. Right. And you become a mob. That's what happens when everybody stops thinking. 
they've become a mob. And, you know, and that's more one easily of my, manipulated. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's one of my things that I bring up in these quotation episodes, these code of honors all the time is this the the mob, the the you know, when the when you listen to Fools the Mob Rules, my great you know, Ronnie James Dio one. And and so Robert, you've done it again. You've not only tied these two together with something you've got, now you've tied every Code of Honor episode we've done well, <laughs> together. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it a step even further and say that when you, when the mob rules and uh, the majority is in charge here, the dignity and sanctity of every human life always suffers. Yes. Always, which we've talked about the sacredness of that. Yeah. Oftentimes, if we can hold that majority rule, as, minority rights is a, there's a reason for that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Because it's uh, you know, people, that's how you guarantee yeah, people that. will suffer. Yeah, just because they're less than fifty one percent does not justify what you're yes. doing. You know, democracy is when two foxes and a and a rabbit decide what's you know vote on what's for dinner. Yes, and, and a republic is when the rabbit has a rifle. Yes. <laughs> So, yes, I remember. I remember that so then, corollary. Yes, use, yes, yes. Yeah. So that that means that carrots are for what's for lunch. That's right. Carrots are what's for lunch. <laughs> That's right. So you know, yeah, the, the the tyranny that of the majority is a very real thing. That's why the founders were genius mm-hmm. in setting up what they did. It's why it will. I don't think certainly in our lifetimes it'll never happen and I don't know that it ever will again in this particular context it's nearly impossible to find that level of genius in really a handful of men relatively speaking to the populace but a relatively large number of men participated in the founding of this country from an intellectual Mm -hmm. perspective and well you know we will not see their likes again I know that but man I'm telling you I cannot believe our best days are behind us that doesn't mean our best days are behind us it means that only it takes a certain skill to lay a foundation. Yeah. All right. That's what the founders did. They laid the foundation. Uh, this is a concept that's come up recently in some of our shows in that as, as Americans, I think what makes us, what makes our country great is your quote, because we are constantly seeking to be better. We don't always achieve all men are created equal. But that's the ideal that we strive towards. We keep redefining things to get there. Yeah. We recognize, oh, we didn't define what that meant well. Well, it's not so much we didn't define well, it, I think, as... slavery. We, we recognize didn't, we had to... Re- well, I guess we do mean all people. Let's fix that. Yeah. You know, we, we recognize that there are limitations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Yeah. We don't, and whether we we think we can overcome them now, and we so, or we can't, we decide to put it off, because that's essentially what they did when they wrote the Constitution. Right. And that's how the three fifths compromise came along, um, and they kind of kicked the can down the road because there was talk of getting rid of slavery at the Constitutional Convention. Well, Declaration too. I mean, South Carolina uh, would would not sign on because of the, some of the language that Jefferson had put in. Uh, that was that was in, inimical to the concept of slavery. Well, yes. Anytime you talk about how there comes a time when free men must rise up against their masters. That's correct. That's right. uh, you know, I mean, that's a hit a little close to home. Hits for, a little close to right, home. Well, some of them. Yeah, and Jefferson has taken a lot of hits recently for his personal life and uh, some of the ways he did things, but you can't argue with the language he wrote. Right. It's hard to recognize the faults in men that we revere so highly. And when you do, it makes you want to get rid of them because you're almost embarrassed yeah. at having it's easy, liked them. easy once you start finding the faults to keep going. Right. And it's, it's easy to lose got, sight of the greatness. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta start, you gotta stop somewhere and find the You also have to recognize that at least what they stood for and using the declaration as a good barometer for Jefferson is a very good one was pure. The idea was not wrong. Right. And therefore, the man may be, because the human being always is. Right. Let, yeah. Let's just judge the ideals that he's working for. Yeah. And, and Franklin on him. and Adams. Right. Or, and, and by the converse, and the, Lee and others in the Confederacy were fighting for a flawed concept. 
You can't come back from that. There's no declaration of independence for the Confederacy. That's correct. Well, they, they just well, there's, there's, people. Well, there was no statement of belief either. Right. Yeah. See, there's, there's no other than leave me alone. That's it, correct. Yeah. That's it. That's all it was. We're fighting because you're down here. That's exactly it. And see, and therein lies the difference. Yeah. Is just because you know patriotism uh, is a fluid term depending on what side you're on at a given moment. But you you're only a patriot if your side wins. That's right. Yeah. In, but, in 2006 and seven, dissent was patriotic. Yeah. In 2009 and 10, it wasn't. Yeah. Well, yes. Well, that's that's correct. It, I mean, it, it's it's cancel culture again. It's it's that whole if if you find yourself in the minority. Or, I mean, in the, in the majority, pause for a minute. Reflect. Right. Because, because it, maybe it's okay. Maybe. But it, it's maybe. something to think about. Because, as a general rule, it has no mind. What you're, kind of what you're talking about yeah. here. Uh, it, it can uh, easily devolve to that. That's I correct. Think. I don't well, think it's automatic. In, in the ad, Well, that means that if there's a leader involved in that majority and some sort of vision that's working with it, sure, it can have that. But, but not necessarily. But not necessarily. Because, because that leader and that vision could be... To turn it into groupthink, to, to wield yeah, the mob group, as a blunt group, instrument. Yeah, it, it seems to be a, uh, it, it, it's a flawed, it's complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. But it's very, but yeah, it's dangerous. I, well, maybe it involves it. thinking. you got to think. Well, and, groupthink and, by definition doesn't. Yeah, and you got to find that, again, that balance, that spot to pause and, and reflect. And, and even within... Figure stuff out. The, the, even if you're in the minority... Or if you have two two opposing groups or multiple opposing groups that don't have a clear majority within your own group, if you are in the majority, you still need, it doesn't you know it doesn't have to be the entire population of the country or even of the planet, because you know, you almost never get a majority there. But you know, if your group is large, if if your group is more than three people. Uh, more more than likely, and even if it's three people, maybe you should stop. Because again, <laughs> two foxes and a and a rabbit, you know, that's three. Um, no matter the size, the tendency is to gang up on those that are in the minority. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and it's, that it's is almost you have to do that. Group think. This is kind of what we we haven't said this, but I think this is what we're talking about. Group think always has to have an opponent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. always has to have something to. And I don't mean a well. No, it's it very a, Nietzschean way of thinking. It could be a cause that it's working against, but most of the time that cause is representative in a person or group. Yeah, um, it, whether it's either a person or a group or what you're working against, sometimes just change, which again is a, is a concept, but right. which which is embodied in a person or group in some in it some, often yeah in some fashion. I'm, I'm trying to work through this. To see no, I get I get what you're saying, but yeah, it's. If you're in the majority, there impl that implies there's somebody that disagrees with you. What do you mean by Nietzsche? We're, we're going to do Nietzsche's a Nietzsche episode very, here next yeah, week. I mean, yeah, I mean, a very mm -hmm. ties right into this whole uh, right with with uh, uh, Twain and everything is is if you hold in higher esteem those who think alike than those who think differently, don't you know? Don't do that. Um, hold hold people who think differently in esteem. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It's it okay really, to think differently. You might come a to thing. a different conclusion, but use your intellect, work through it all, combine experience and it's facts right. and intellect and come to where you are. Think for yourself. If there was a time in this country and in this world in, in western society when honest intellectual discourse and by that I mean people come, sitting down to talk about issues and ideas to flesh things out to work through things to, to understand things better together uh, you know might you might have seen that in, in France in the salons uh, of higher society uh, you know it might have just been the local watering hole where guys sat around and, and shot the shit mm -hmm. pardon my French but it was a very much a real thing that that intellectual discourse was important. And it implies that not everybody agrees. It's inherent. Not everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. That's kind of what makes it fun. And at one time, 
we well we've begun to concentrate power and thinking alike is a path to power yes yes and so now that power is so important it becomes much more difficult to be different it does um, and and young people think they are being different when they make their hair green or blue or purple or when they get tattoos but if everybody has a tattoo, then suddenly you're not unique. That's right. You're not different. It's like the life of Brian. You're all individuals. Yes, yes we're, we're all, all individuals. individuals. Uh, I'm, I'm not. not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But what we're talking about really here is individuality of the mind. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you can be with your natural hair color and not have a tattoo and be different. And be unique and be yourself. Well, you're speaking, as we at Snakes and Otters understand, that which goes on in our minds is more important than our physicality. Yes. Because, going back to my favorite thing, it's about that inherent dignity of the human person. There you go. That human person is not defined by their hair color, their whether or not they have piercings or tattoos, and dare I say it, not defined by their skin color. Correct. All of these things are external. They have nothing to do with your worth as a person. That's right. And extend that, extend those qualifications as far as you want to, uh, with regard to uh, uh, sexual orientation or uh, uh, gender or you know all those buzzwords that are very current about you know that I, I want to be seen for me for myself as, and they use that as a def definer. The, the, it doesn't matter. All of you are sacred. All of you matter. Yeah, I, I get the the. The desire to define that way because for so long, uh, in those areas you talked about, yeah. there's a, there's an oppression that's there was there. an oppression correct. so that, and that needs to be railed against. That's and correct. That's what you know by by proudly declaring what you are in defiance of the oppression, which honestly, for the most part, no longer exists in those areas. Well, that's kind of where my point with all this is. You know that battle has been won at least in law. I understand. And mostly in in, 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 real, in, in real cultural life. expression. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. And I think that that has gotten to the point now where let us recognize that we are all beautiful, wonderful, and these externals really don't matter. Right. Your blood's red and your money's green. That means you're an American. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I always say. Your blood's red and your money's green. You're that's an right. American. That's right. That's all that matters to me. So, anyways. So... I think, yes, Martin? No, no. Keep oh, going. oh I, I thought you had something you wanted to say. No, just, uh, just give me our time. time. Yes. So, I think with all of these things, you know, we dance around it all the time. Uh, you know, but it all goes back to um, it's possible to be an individual in the middle of a group. And as you were saying, all these young people that do all the same things to be different. Are kind of missing the point. Yeah, be different up here. Yeah, yeah. He's tapping his head. Um, be different where it counts, but in doing so, be cognizant of the fact that you know you may not be right. Now, uh, speaking as members of clergy, mm -hmm. now we do believe there are absolutes, and sure. we do have differing opinions on the on how certain things are expressed and certain definitions. And that is going to be problematic for us going forward, not so much from a moral perspective, but I think from a societal perspective. Yeah, That's causing issues. Practically speaking, yeah. How, do, how, how does the application of certain truths uh, play out? Right. And that is going to be problematic, not so much for us to have to deal with on belief side, but, you know, there's potential persecution. Yeah, which, has to, which, cannot, which must not happen. You know, it, it, probably nobody, will. Nobody, uh, unfortunately, we uh, we humans are all far too often weak-minded, right? And persecution is one of those things. It's very much as part of the group think. It's an expression. It's of expression of this. It's yeah. expression of that. Exactly right. Not, it's an interesting tolerance of a difference. And the interesting thing is, it's a rural reversal mm -hmm. because it wasn't that long ago where, uh, not just at the church level, but governmental and societal. All of that was reversed, where the things that that we've just talked about, as far as gender differences and, and sexual orientation, were uh, vilely persecuted and violently persecuted. Um, and so now, 
you know, the majority that did that, uh, you know, that majority is long gone, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? The positions right. that were the majority are now shifting to the minority. And so those that wanted the, major, the former majority to stop and pause and reflect are now being put in a position where they need to stop and pause and reflect. Mm -hmm. And part of being fully human. It is. Mm -hmm. And that's this whole mob mentality, this committee mentality is antithetical to that when it's at its worst. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll never get better as long as that is in charge. The mob mentality. The mob mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, this is terrific. Uh, Robert, you've done it again. And again, we've, we've, we've hit dignity and leadership and contributing and usefulness. And <laughs> we've skirted Nietzsche and John Stuart Mill and I don't know how many other... Uh, Philosophers and concepts here. I mean, just the concepts alone. Uh, it's wow. pretty heady stuff. Yeah, jumped all around. That's why we love these Code of Honor episodes. They are always deep, deep, deep thoughts. Yeah, yeah we talk about them, especially as we talk about going into them or, or we say up next, as if they're the funniest things we do. And they, some of them start out that way. Yeah. And, you know, we certainly get yeah. our humor. Yeah, and, and here I was going, well, I'm going to go in a totally different direction. Talk about something like it hits me at work. But then it ended up being the same thing. Well, it ended up being because humanity goes into everything we do. That's right. Yeah. We bring that's, ourselves to everything. That's right. Yeah. Good well, and you know, bad. It, yes. When you say it's the same thing again, it's it's always fresh. It's always different. But we just have certain things we love to talk about that yeah. are good inherently and it brings good. us. Our, and well, it's the reason that these quotes appeal to us. Correct. Not just yeah. us. Hopefully, hopefully but, but yes. for, hopefully, for everyone. Yeah. 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 It's the We're reason always, these things stand out in the history of of. Thought. And if we give people a reason to think and evaluate themselves critically and the world that they live in critically, we've done our job, gentlemen. Even That's if they think we're full of shit. Perhaps, if, but if as long as they them, think about it first. Yes, as long as they thought through it and went, well, I think those guys are full of shit. That's right. Yeah. Then that's you okay. Know, At least you thought. Uh, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Ex explain why. <laughs> it sounds you know, great. Defend your conclusion. That's correct. We Socratic rarely method. take a position that is um, a... Uh, categorical um, absolute on issues or, 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 or things, ideas is where we, well, we talk about. That's the ultimate question. Well, yeah, that's because Trevor things. Slattery appears in every episode. He does. <laughs> he, he is our special guest star every that's every great. episode. Yes, that's right. Um, and that's the thing. You know, we may talk about those same ideas a lot, but we 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 use a lot of different starting points. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I hope by now listeners get when they listen to these Code of Honors, is that it all comes back to these issues, these these ultimate questions, you know, these pointless or eternal questions, these pointless discussions. Well, discussion they're not questions. really pointless. That's correct. <laughs> and, well, and, but they're often un, unknown by so many in an articulate manner. And hopefully we can bring that out and let people think about why they believe what they believe, because they have a reason. Yeah. And you know, define it and figure out: is it pure selfishness, or is it deeper yeah. than that? And it works in both directions. It does. I want to be challenged. I'm hoping listeners will challenge us at some point. That's right. You know, I'm perfectly okay with a listener sends us an email, hint, hint, or tweets to us, hint, hint, that hey, that position you took on on episode sixty eight, that was just total crap. It you know. You really missed yes. the boat. Well, on defend that. Us, your conclusion. That's right. Tell us why. Yeah, but you got to defend it. You can't you just defend it. Yeah, Give us a chance to refute. We don't. But. We don't believe in uh, spurless uh, assertions. You know, no is, ad hominems here. That's life right. is deeper than a tweet. Yes, it well is. Even like though the that. tweet is now 280 characters, that's it's, right. it's a lot of fun. It's not nothing wrong with Twitter. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, we're there. But life is is deeper than a tweet. Yeah. Gentlemen, I think we have uh, pummeled that expired equine about as much as we can. Uh, Francis, what is up next? You're going to love this one because you're captaining the next one. We're going to do another Our Heroes, but this is the first fictional Our Hero that we've brought up. And we actually had a little bit of a debate whether or not we're going to include this because he is fictional. But, hey, I voted for him, and I think you did too. Steve Rogers, Captain America. It doesn't get more heroic than that. We're going to go deep with the character, why we love him, why he is a model uh, for all of us, in many respects, of that which is good 
in us all. Uh, he's an amazing character. Uh, we know you love him. We love him. We're going to go deep with him next episode. Don't miss it. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.